Hello. Hi, Tracy. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me to do this. Sorry? Thank you for asking me to do this. Oh, you're quite welcome. And, and I'm sorry for the, we're, we're having technical difficulties. <laughs> it's always the way, isn't it? <laughs> so what we're going to do, if you don't mind, is we're going to record this and then post it on our YouTube channel. If yeah, that works for you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, wonderful. So uh, what I'm going to do basically is just uh, do a brief introduction and then uh, I'll, I'll just ask you some questions and, uh, yeah. then, you know, give you time for, for um, you know, any kind of comments and things that you'd like to do. That sounds great. I, as I said, I haven't really, you know, other than the book being in my head, I haven't come prepared with anything. So let's just let the conversation flow and, you know, go from there. So. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. OK, great. So, uh, OK, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, I want to. Uh, Thank you for, for joining us for the uh, live stream with uh, Kate Moore. Um, I'm Tracy McIntyre. I am the Director of Communications with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And I want to encourage everybody to uh, check out our museum. Our website is civilwarmed.org. And uh, today we are pleased to have Kate Moore, New York Times and USA Today bestselling author. Kate is the author of The Radium Girls, which won the 2017 Goodreads Choice Award for Best History, was voted U.S. Librarian's Favorite Nonfiction Book of 2017, and was named a Notable Nonfiction Book of 2018 by the American Library Association. And I have read Radium Girls. I highly recommend. Excellent book. Thank you. Uh, Kate, Kate is a British writer based near Cambridge in the UK. Kate writes across a variety of genres and has had multiple titles on the Sunday Times bestseller list. Her latest book is the critically acclaimed The Woman They Could Not Silence, which, among other accolades, was named runner-up for Best History in the 2021 Goodreads Choice Awards and 2021 Book List Editor's Choice. And it is that, this book, that we will be discussing today. Welcome, Kate. Thank you so much, Tracy. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to meet you virtually. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you got interested in writing and history? Sure. Um, well, I mean, I have to say the fact that I sort of do this as my job, it, it, I have to pinch myself like every day that this is this is what I get to do. Um, because when I was a little girl, you know, growing up in England, I always wanted to be a writer. Um, and actually, when I did my GCSEs, which is sort of the end of high school exams, I did quite well. And, and I came across an article the other day um, where a, a journalist had interviewed me and they said, oh, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a best-selling writer. Oh, <laughs> Not hey. just a writer, a best-selling writer. <laughs> goal <laughs> achieved. <laughs> and goal achieved. I mean, it's amazing. Um, how I came to write history is it, it's what it's one of those sort of journeys that I never would have expected. It was a total passion project that got me into writing history. Um, I didn't do history at, at, at college. Um, you know, always interested in history because. I think history is about stories, it's about people, and you know, that's always appealed to me. But I never studied it. But in 2015, I directed a play, because I'm a theatre person, um, theatre is one of my passions, and I directed a play about the Radium Girls. And because I wanted my theatre production to be authentic, I did lots of research to try and, you know, uncover you know, the facts behind this real story that we were depicting on stage. You know, I really cared about the real women that my actresses were portraying and we wanted to know everything about them. And I was stunned to realise there wasn't a book that actually focused on the individual radium girls themselves. There were books about their remarkable legal legacy. There were books about, you know, the incredible science in their story, you know, so many milestones and, and landmarks and unique scientific knowledge and medical knowledge that's come from the story of the radium girls but people seem to have forgotten about the sort of humanity and the people behind that moniker the radium girls and they didn't know the names Catherine Donahue and Grace Fryer and by that point having immersed myself in their story for the play I felt passionately that these women deserved a book 
that looked at them as individuals, that remembered their names and honoured the sacrifice that they made and honoured their courage. And so ultimately I thought, well, why don't I write it? You know, if no one else has done it, why don't I? And as you described in the introduction, you know, the book came out and it was totally beyond my wildest dreams that it became a New York Times bestseller, that it was critically acclaimed, that it won the Goodreads Choice Award for Best History. And, you know, all of that was just incredible. And from that, you know, I was then able to think about well, what do I want to write next? Mm -hmm. And that is what led me to The Woman They Could Not Silence. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, as I said, um, you know, I, I read Radium Girls and and I, I think a, a lot of times it's it's really um, for me, it's your writing style is so accessible and it just makes it so interesting. It's like reading a novel almost. It's really amazing. That's what that's what I aim for. So that's brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> you, you got it. <laughs> So for those of uh, uh, people in our audience who have not read your book, uh, can you give us a brief synopsis of the story of Elizabeth Packard? Yeah, so Elizabeth Packard is the heroine of The Woman They Could Not Silence. And her story starts on the cusp of the American Civil War, which is why I'm here tonight talking to you. Um, it starts on a hot summer's night in June, 1860. And it starts with a simple question. What would happen if your husband could commit you to an insane asylum just because you disagreed with him? And that is how Elizabeth Packard's story starts. She is a housewife in Illinois. She is a wife uh, to a preacher, Theophilus Packard. She is a mother of six. Her youngest is just 18 months old. And because she's been inspired by the women's rights movement, um, history buffs among you, which I'm sure is many people on this call, probably know that 1848 marked, uh, you know, that incredible convention in Seneca Falls, New York, uh, the feminist declaration um, of sentiments, you know, the start of the US national women's rights movement. And Elizabeth was inspired by that. You know, to be honest, she wasn't, you know, pushing the boundaries massively. She just wanted to have her own voice, her own opinions, you know, and started to assert herself in a Bible class, you know, if she wanted to write an essay, if she wanted to make a theological point. But this was just anathema to her husband. And he literally, you know, said he thought his wife had gone insane on the subject of women's rights. And it was by law his right to lock up his wife in a mental hospital if he wanted to. It literally was on the statute in black and white that a husband could send his wife to an insane asylum by request and specifically and it literally said this on the statute books without the evidence of insanity that was required in other cases wow. and so <laughs> at hot summer's night june 1860 elizabeth is locked up in an insane asylum even though she's not mad and the story charts her journey it charts what's happened next how do you cope in that situation you know, how do you survive? And in Elizabeth's case, she not only survives, but she thrives and she becomes the woman they could not silence in the end. Yes, yes. And it is a very compelling story. And it's it's almost sort of like a suspense novel in a way, because you're wondering, when you're reading so. through it, how the heck is she yeah. going to get out of this? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, when, when I first discovered her story, that, that was part of what I loved about it. I loved her. I loved her courage and her strength. I loved her writing because she becomes a writer. She keeps a secret journal um, and so on. But I love the drama of her story. As you say, it's like a suspense novel. Um, I like the, the sort of gothic horror of the story, you know, taking you inside those insane asylums of the mid 19th century. You know, what was really going on behind those doors, behind those brick walls? And then the courtroom drama as well. You know, Elizabeth has this sort of landmark legal trial. Um, everyone is sort of on the, the edges of their seats trying to find out what will happen. Um, she takes the stand in her own defence. There's just so much drama in it. It's just such a gift to a storytelling writer uh, like myself. Absolutely. And where did you first hear of her story? So it, the short answer is I first read her name in a University of Wisconsin essay. Um, about <laughs> lunacy in the 19th century <laughs> that's that's where I, I came across her name 
the long answer is that I was inspired to write The Woman They Could Not Silence because of the Me Too movement um, from 2017. Mm -hmm. And what I found interesting about that movement was, you know, the the difference about that movement, why it was such a landmark thing, um, why it was so iconic and such a cultural shift was because women were not only speaking out, because I think we always have done, the difference was that we were being listened to and crucially believed. Right. That was the difference. The belief yes. was there and the the space to, to let a woman have a voice and be heard was there. And that it sort of got me thinking, you know, why is it taken until 2017 for, for that to happen? And one way that women have been silenced and discredited in the past is this false claim that we're crazy you know and it still happens today you know it, and and that's what i was interested in the fact that this was something that had been going on for centuries but it still had relevance in the modern day you know if if a woman accuses a man of rape one of his reactions will be you're crazy you know that didn't happen a woman runs for president um you know she'll be called hysteric she'll be called crazy you know she can't be trusted with the red button because she's hormonal yeah. and you know right right uh, <laughs> So it, you know, it's still around today. And so I decided that that was what I wanted to write about this, um, this historic silencing of women through this false claim that we're crazy. You know, that's how we've been dismissed in the past and undermined. And I wanted to explore that through one, one woman's story, a sane woman from history accused of being mad when she wasn't. Um, and I crucially wanted my story to have an uplifting ending you know I wanted it to be a a woman who didn't just get locked up in an asylum and they threw away the key I wanted her to have prevailed and you know succeeded and and, and thrived and I didn't even know when I started researching if such a woman existed Um, but luckily for me I stumbled on that University of Wisconsin essay and I found the name Elizabeth Packard and the rest as they say is history. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> now, as as um, as you were saying, she uh, was such a trailblazer in a way for 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 women's rights. And is there some a particular um, aspect of her personality that you that you really really admire? I th- I think the thing that is is really extraordinary about Elizabeth Packard is her unwavering faith in herself. And I actually think that's a lesson we can all learn from um, and be inspired by when you read her story and and you read her words in her journal and and you realise what she went through. You know, when she gets into the asylum and she meets Dr. Andrew McFarland, who's the the doctor, the superintendent of the Illinois State Hospital, she realises she can get out. Um, All she has to do is to agree to become an obedient wife you know, to follow the norms of society, to shut her mouth, um, to not express her opinions, you know, all she has to do is conform, you know, to become convenient rather than inconvenient. And she refuses to do it um, because she knows she isn't mad and she doesn't want to say, yes, I was mad, I was mad before when I was using my voice, but now I shall, you know, be sane and be quiet. She was like, no, this is wrong. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going to, disavow my truth and what I know to be reality in order to fit in with you you know you're the crazy ones if you're if you send me away when I'm not mad you know that's the insane thing um and I think the way she sort of sticks to her guns despite everything that's thrown at her despite the fact that when she confronts the doctor about his techniques about his abuse of patients you know he responds by sending her to a a worse ward um you know, just horrific, you know, environment that she finds herself in, despite everything that happens to her, she is true to herself and her beliefs and her knowledge of the world. And she refuses to fit the mould, basically. Um, she, She fights on no matter what might happen, because she knows it's the right thing to do. And, and she will not, you know, as I say, disavow that truth. She stays true to herself. And I think that's incredibly admirable. Absolutely. I mean, her, her tenacity was amazing. Just, um, I mean, she didn't give up. 
and and yeah. in that situation there are a lot of people that that might have just given in and just said okay I'll, yeah. I'll say whatever you want me to say I'll sign whatever you want me to sign exactly you know. <laughs> yeah exactly and yeah. you know and and the other thing really that is sort of speaks to her mental strength as well is that as she points out you know because you know one of the things she's shocked about when she first gets to the asylum and you know even on that very first day when she wakes up the next morning you know walks down the hall to the breakfast room is stunned to realize that the ward she is first on is incredibly civilized you know there are cloths on the table there's you know glasses to drink from there's you know beautiful crockery um and the biggest shock of all is not this civility it's the other women that she meets who are just as sane as she is mm -hmm. and you know the doctor's own notes from the era say that they would admit women who cause the greatest annoyances to their families you know who defied domestic control is the phrase that stays with me um and she realizes you know it, it's not just me that this has happened to this is you know this is a, a problem they are literally committing sane women but the tragedy is because of the conditions that they're in um because this is a, a punishment if you will that has no end it's not like you're in prison and you've been sentenced for three months you know, the women could be held there indefinitely, and, and some were. Um, and, and in the end, for, for many of them, they may have been sane when they were sent there, but the treatment can actually cause them to become mentally ill and insane. And the remarkable thing about Elizabeth is, is she managed to survive, you know, I think partly she would say by taking on the mantle of, I'm going to do something about this injustice, you know, she had a purpose and she became even more driven than she'd been on the outside. You know, it, it actually allowed her to become the woman she, I think, always had it in her to be, you know, to, to become a, an activist, to become a fighter and a survivor and someone who would speak for the rights, not only for herself, but for others. But, you know, for many people, that wasn't the case. It was a tragedy that they were admitted sane and became insane in the end. Right. And and uh, just because um, we're the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, I wanted to mention, too, about the fact that uh, after the Civil War, there were so many uh, soldiers that were suffering from PTSD and what we know today is PTSD. But they didn't understand that back then. And, um, you know, as the the whole idea of uh, psychological analysis and all of that didn't exist. Um, and it was just really um, when I was reading about Elizabeth's experience, I was also in the back of my mind thinking, you know, did the did the Civil War soldiers that were committed to these asylums also have a similar experience where whereas they were just suffering from PTSD, they weren't really insane. Um, and, you know, that what what kind of treatment would they have gotten? Would they have just been, you know, given opium or whatever and here, you know, calm down and, and, and but forever incarcerated? Um, that's what's really um, the tragedy there for, for these soldiers, too. Absolutely. And I actually, when I was looking through my um, notes before um, I came onto the call tonight, I actually found a, a research note that said, around the time, um, sort of it was about 1963, so the uh, war had been going on for a couple of years by then, I actually found a note that there'd been a memo circulated in the army that reminded people it was illegal to dismiss insane soldiers. So actually, even if they started to struggle with the mental health mid-war and express symptoms of PTSD, they would have been kept on. It was actually, they couldn't actually get a medical discharge at that time anyway according to this circular you know that oh, went around wow. saying um that as I say it's just a note I found in my research files but it said it, a circular went round saying it would be illegal to dismiss soldiers um who would become insane wow so they, they would by the time the war ends and they're hopefully able to get some treatment they'd have been in an even worse condition and to speak to your question yes it would have been similar to what Elizabeth experienced you know the Illinois State Hospital took men as well as women um there there were a variety of techniques that that were used you know the the ideal of the asylum when when they were first built um in the 1840s 1850s and so on was that an asylum would be a place of of rest of, you know literally as the definition of asylum is you know a, a peaceful retreat um a sanctuary mm -hmm. and so they tended to be you know uh, beautiful buildings you know uh, beautifully designed in, in stunning grounds 
but Elizabeth said that it was kind of like a, a hell disguised as a heaven because when you actually got inside you know the ideal was people could rest in these beautiful surroundings but ultimately as the numbers grew and grew they had to sort of restrain the patients really in order to control them when you have that many people um, some of whom are genuinely mentally ill um, others who are railing against the injustice that they're incarcerated when there is no need for them to be incarcerated so restraints were used um, that took a, a variety of forms there were uh, muffs and mittens you know things that were used on the hands there were boxes that they literally you know shut people up into to, to try and calm them down drugs were used um, sometimes still at the very experimental stage you know I had notes from doctors uh, one of whom said he was taking uh, conium, which was a, a fairly new drug used to treat the insane at that time. He he wanted to, uh, you know, take it himself to ascertain the effects. Wow. And he said he was sort of left unable to to climb the stairs unassisted, uh, unassisted and had uh, double vision. Wow. So, um, you know, this was all very new. Um, people did use things like ether, chloroform. Um, the doctors that I was studying as I wrote the woman they could not silence I was obviously specifically looking for evidence of how women were treated in the asylum because of the feminist slant I took on the subject and they said they would use drugs on the female side of the house as they put it more so if there was a boisterous woman they you know they'd knock her out for three days with ether um wow and and do that um and they also use things like cannabis um, you know, that was a treatment from the era uh, as well. Um, and then there were surgical treatments for, for women. I don't know whether men um, were surgically operated on in the same way at that time. Um, as you know, from reading the book in women's case, because there was this whole, you know, allegedly medical, allegedly scientific theory uh, that a woman's menstrual cycle, her female sexual organs determined her mental insanity they thought that uh, women's sexual organs you know led to hysteria I and mean, you think about the word link hysteria um hysterectomy and so on it's all the same the same route um and so they doctors would actually operate on female patients they believed to be insane in the hope that um removing their ovaries removing their clitoris um and so on would lead to you know mental recovery wow uh, this was the, these were the treatments that that were going on uh, in the 19th century and beyond in some cases right wow that's just uh i mean it's 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 sad for uh for to think about that issue with both the women and the men but but the women especially too because like you said i you know i don't know i don't think they did anything for the men as far as as physically mm. change them um but yeah it's just it must have been just a horrendous horrendous experience for for anybody that was in there um because if they were seriously mentally ill that the, the the medical world just didn't have the knowledge to help them really the way that we would help them today with counseling and things like that yeah exactly Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, he, you know, Andrew McFarlane was a sort of early proponent of, um, you know, befriending his uh, clients, as it were, you know, and in some ways you could sort of see it as a talking therapy. He would be a sort of shoulder to cry on. Uh, you know, he would sit and listen. And Elizabeth initially is, you know, very struck by that process and does sort of half fall in love with the with the doctor um, because he's listening to her and, and so on. But um the way that Farland sort of sees it is that he compared himself to Prospero to the women's Caliban you know he he sees them as these untamed beasts um and he's the cultured civilized one he listens he forms a bond with them so that he can learn to control them um and show them the right way to behave in the hope that that relationship he's forged um you know will will encourage them to follow his direction basically and, um, and I think that uh, in in while well, while I'm reading the book and and uh, with Dr. McFarlane, and I think she she learned finally, you know, not to trust him because it was so funny because I I kept saying, don't listen to him, don't yeah. trust him, don't do it. <laughs> Completely, <laughs> I was I was chatting that the whole time through my research as well, Tracy. <laughs> 
and it, it was sort of uh you know you just you just wanted to 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 reach out to her and just say you know you you can't you can't be listening to this guy and but but she, like you said i think she she half fell in love with him and and she yeah. just she needed somebody there as an emotional support because she was all by herself and i yeah. i don't know if it was like a stockholm syndrome thing too going on yeah. um but yeah i was just i i kept saying don't don't fall for it <laughs> yeah <laughs> well um and in, in researching about um the uh the insane asylums of the of the 19th century um did you ever talk about or read about um the the Nellie Bly and the um the undercover I did investigation ten, ten days in a madhouse yes yeah I yeah. did it was actually it was actually later than Elizabeth I think Nellie Bly might have been is it 1880s maybe? 1887 yes. 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 yes yes and I was just wondering if Nellie Bly knew about Elizabeth Packard and maybe that was part of her inspiration for doing this I don't know do you know if they it, ever I don't I didn't come across any link between them um in my research um what I will say is that Elizabeth Elizabeth was nationally famous you know she was known from coast to coast um you know entirely due to her own efforts you know once she manages finally uh, to get out of the asylum um she continues her activism and she becomes this incredible uh, best selling author you know she's financially independent um and she uses that financial independence in order to campaign politically for the rights of women and the mentally ill. You know, she never forgets um, the experiences that she witnessed in the asylum and that she herself experienced. And she dedicates her life to improving the conditions of, of, for those in the asylum and, and for the mentally ill, uh, which takes on even more power when her daughter becomes genuinely mentally ill in, in later life. Um, so I think it's entirely possible that Nellie Bly did know about Elizabeth that, you know, and it would have been, uh, you know, a, a really useful thing to do to go back into the asylums in the 1880s and see what, you know, is it still as bad as it was in Elizabeth Packard's day? Mm -hmm. um, has anything changed? Has it not? You know, what's the situation? And of course, Nellie acts mad in order to get into the madhouse and then, you know, shakes off those garbs of madness and is entirely her sane self within and finds it you know impossible to get released it's only because um, I think it's the editor of her newspaper manages to get her out in the end yeah. um you know but being a sane woman in an asylum is not enough to get out basically um, right so basically so, in the yeah. in the 20 plus years since Elizabeth Packard when Nellie Bly was in there not much had changed unfortunately um, no. quite the expose that you know Elizabeth Packard's story was and and her crusades and everything it was it was just uh it was shocking to me that you know that 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 really not much had changed I, I'm, I'm assuming that you know some asylums did change um, yeah and, and there were some you know some of the things that Elizabeth um brought about did you know do did and do help you know she uh campaigned for patients postal rights so that they weren't entirely cut off in the asylum because there was a lot of censorship and letters not getting through letters not being sent out so she campaigned on laws for that um she also campaigned so that there were inspections um was successful in some places in getting a female inspector on the board um which was obviously very ahead of its time in in the mid 19th century um so you know elizabeth was a very practical campaigner so she was all about small steps to improve the lives of others and ge and generally succeeded in that she sort of was very clever i think and astute in assessing what the lie of the land was and not being too ambitious mm -hmm. you know she knew women wouldn't get the votes at that time so right. she wasn't a hardcore um suffragist you know she she was like that battle is for an, for another time and actually she used it to her advantage she would say if you don't do this small thing that i'm asking for you know women clearly have no protection in law and then i would have to campaign for women to have the vote <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think, I think people were so in fear of her <laughs> taking up the mantle that they would do what she said right right because she just had such a powerful voice and such a recognized yeah. voice yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Um, i mean um, I, I think 
the other sorry just to make one final point on on you know as you say the depressing thing that things hadn't changed between elizabeth packard and nelly bly the really depressing thing is is that we still you know see investigations coming out now about uh you know care homes or hospitals where staff have been abusive to, to patients you know even as i was researching the book there were cases in the uk coming out you know particularly you know uh, autism homes things like that you know the children being abused i i think basically there's you know it's it's one of the most awful things about humanity that where there's an imbalance of power people will abuse it you know no matter how many safeguards you try and put in place and the thing is to 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 pull that out you know to expose it where it exists and and try and get justice for the victims but that's a really depressing thing that it seems to be an element of human nature that if there's an imbalance of power some people will abuse that Absolutely. And, and uh, I, I had my own experience with that um, when I had to place my mom in a nursing home. Mm. And, uh, you know, both she and I were, were terrified about, you know, finding a place that where elder abuse wasn't, you know, wasn't a thing. I mean, you just, it's yeah. just a scary thing because you just don't know. And, and you know that uh, when you're going in there, they're always putting their best foot forward. And, and yeah. uh, so you, you have to you have to rely on, uh, you know, like Better Business Bureau and things like that uh, to fi- find a, a place that's that's safe and, and, and comfortable for your loved yeah. one. So, yeah. uh, I, I mean, and, and it had nothing to do with her, uh, her mental state. Um, it was just that, you know, she physically. She was, yeah, was vulnerable because yeah. of her age, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, and, and that was, um, you know, just about five years ago. So yeah. it's, it's still recently, it's still an issue, as you said, it, it still mm-hmm. is. Um, and, and. I love the postscript to the book that you had about the the story with uh, with Nancy Pelosi mm-hmm. and uh, and no, some of not the other. Not everyone does. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's just a good illustration of of how uh, women can still be so easily dismissed in in a man's world by just saying, "Oh, don't listen to them; they're crazy." Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and women don't know their place or they're speaking out too much or, or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I really think that, uh, that that was, that was great that you put that in there because it really did tie it right up to modern times. Yeah, and exactly. I'm wondering what women can learn from Elizabeth Packard's story that can help them in modern times. Oh, I mean, I, I think there's so much, you know, she was such an inspirational and a modern figure, like strangely, you know, that that's, she herself said, you know, part of the reason she was put in the asylum, you know, as she said, she said, I'm sort of 25 years ahead of my contemporaries. And, and that's, you know, people are so far behind me that they can't see, you know, the, the rightness of the positions that I advocate. Um, and actually, I think 25 years w- was too, too few, you know, and um, I, I think, you know that there there are so many things you know just on a very practical level um and to give an example of how forward thinking she is um when she gets out of the asylum I you know I mentioned that she became a best-selling author she did that entirely under her own steam you know no publisher would touch her because she was you know a former patient of a mental hospital she was a woman trying to strike out on her own you know everything against her was was, was a no-no and so Elizabeth decided okay well I shall self-publish and she got a quote from a printer which was you know thousands of dollars you know and she literally had nothing to her name um her husband had run off with all the money and the children she was literally left with the dress she stood up in and and that was it but because she was such a dynamic person and so charismatic and magnetic she decided essentially i'm going to crowdfund them <laughs> obviously <laughs> We didn't use that phrase back then. That's not quite how she put it, but that's what she did. She would knock on doors and say, I, I want to tell you my story and I, I want to write a book about it, but I don't, you know, I would I would need your support. And she basically persuaded thousands of people to give her 50 cents before wow. they'd even, you know, had anything. And with all those 50 cents, she got enough capital to print the books that she then sold they all sold out people talked about it it became a word of mouth hit um and she became this you know best-selling author with financial independence 
Um, so as, as I said, that's just one example of how forward thinking and, and incredible she was. I think speaking more generally, people, as I say, can be inspired by her faith in herself. They can, in, I think, really be inspired by the fact that she perseveres no matter how long it takes. Um, she has courage. She has resilience. She takes what has been thrown at her. And it's almost through that crucible of suffering that she becomes stronger. And she actually wrote about it in this way in one of her journals. She said, um, uh, she's talking about when she's in the asylum and the fact that, you know, as she calls it, it was a woman crushing treatment. They were trying to stamp out any trace of individuality um, just to sort of make these Stepford wives sort of dolls. They were the ones who were allowed to leave the asylum. And she says, in my case, this woman crushing machinery works the wrong way. <laughs> the, true wo <laughs> the true woman shines brighter and brighter under the process instead of being strangled. And I think we can all learn from that, that, you know, when the chips are down and, you know, people are trying to belittle us, to tell us that our truth is wrong, um, to tell us that what we're fighting for isn't possible or isn't worth it um, or isn't sane then that's the moment when you steal yourself and you think um, this isn't going to crush me, it's going to make you stronger. Um, and that's what we can take from the story of Elizabeth Packard. That is that is extremely inspiring. And, and I think about other women uh, during her time that, that sort of um, went against the stereotype. And, and mainly I'm thinking because we're the Civil War Medicine Museum, I'm thinking to Clara Barton, um, who, yeah. who was not... Um, in a marriage or or any kind of relationship that where she could be threatened with what happened to Elizabeth and who just went ahead and did what she did um yeah. and in the beginning did not have any kind of support and by just going ahead and doing what she did go you know bringing all the aid to the soldiers and becoming a nurse and all of that uh just proved by doing um that she was capable and and not crazy <laughs> yeah um but i think it, you know if if she had been married i don't know that she would have been able to do what she did absolutely it, it kind of depends as as ever on how supportive her husband was but you know reading the doctor's notes from you know the civil war in that era um you know wanting to run off and become a nurse uh was cited as evidence of madness you know that was a woman who wanted to do that wasn't right in the head you know and there was this whole um whole ethos of thinking or whatever that they called it um moral insanity and it the definition was basically eccentricity of conduct if you were acting eccentrically according to the narrow parameters that the doctors who were in charge set if you were acting eccentrically you were mad and therefore you could be sent to an asylum have your clitoris cut off, um, you know, be subject to ether and chloroform, you know, and be silenced and have all those other treatments as well. And that was literally in in the doctor's notes that, you know, running, wanting to run off and become a nurse because that meant that you weren't content to be in your domestic sphere and just be a wife, just be a mother. That desire to run away, to do something different to operate, as you say, in a, in a man's world, essentially in a hospital, even though it's a, a caring responsibility and so on, um, that was seen as evidence of madness. Wow, I, I, I was not aware of that, that yeah. it literally says, going, running away to be a nurse makes yeah. you crazy. That's, I am yeah. not aware of not that. Not makes you crazy, the, the wanting or to, you know. Means, the means that you are crazy, right? Means right. you are crazy. Yeah. Right, wow. Because, yeah. and, and that that makes uh, makes what uh, women like Dorothea Dix, who started the first uh, Women's Army Nursing Corps, even yeah. braver for yeah. actually, you know, getting that idea out there. And, and then she's recruiting women to come in and do, and take part in the Army Nursing Corps. And and no, but knowing that, you know, in the mindset of a lot of men, that makes them crazy. Yeah. Uh, that's that's just wild. I had no idea. I had no idea. Um, with it, following that, since I was surprised about that, was there anything that you were surprised about in your research of Elizabeth? Did anything really surprise you? 
I, I think to be honest, some of the treatments that I've talked about, you know, already that particularly the surgical treatments, that that was the real shocker for me. Um, and as I say, just to, to actually read the doctor's notes and realize what they were saying was a symptom of madness and therefore necessitated this barbaric torture. That was the really shocking thing. You know, the, the doctor's notes reveal that, you know, some of the women who underwent that procedure included um, a 20 year old patient whose only so-called symptom of madness was that she liked to engage in serious reading because a woman, you know, to use her brain to want to read, that was seen as, as madness, you know, particularly a woman that wanted to read a lot, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then there was another patient who was 30 um, and it said, her, you know, the reason they cited for doing the operation in her case was um, she had expressed dislike for the society of her husband, um, you know, so, yeah. but that, of course, you know, she was, she was a wife, she was a woman, she should love being around her husband, you know, that, that was what happened to Elizabeth Packard as well, you know, she dared to say that this husband who was oppressing her, who was threatening to send her to an asylum at this time, she dared to express dislike of that. And that was cited as evidence of, of madness, you know, in, in her, her legal cases and in her medical notes, you know, the fact that she disliked her husband because a wife should love her husband. And if you dislike him, well, that's madness, you know. Right. So that, that was how the theory ran, you know, the, the medical theory that doctors subscribe to. Wow. That's what it, it said. And, and the fact that um, at, at the beginning of the book, it's, it talks about her attending the Bible class because uh, her husband was a, a minister, he was a minister, correct? A minister, yeah, yeah. 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 So attending a Bible class at his church and, and she's questioning some of the teachings that he's a proponent of. Yeah. And God forbid that, you know, she should be questioning, not only she's questioning him as her husband, but she's questioning him as her spiritual advisor too yeah. and yeah. that was the kind of the double whammy there <laughs> yeah and the, the thing that was really shocking having researched that was that you know obviously she should be allowed to express her opinion you know regardless of this background that I'm about to share you know if she if she wants to to, to challenge him to have a different opinion that's absolutely fair game as far as I'm concerned but what was specific about this theological battle between Elizabeth and her husband Theophilus is that Theophilus had actually he was the one that had actually signed up to some uh changing the theology basically there was pre-civil war um people a lot a lot of people a lot of rich people didn't want there to be a civil war they were worried about the economic and social repercussions should the United States try and tear itself apart so um there was a very rich man called Cyrus McCormick who actually funded um, a sort of, um, it, it wasn't necessarily pro-slavery, but he didn't want anti-slavery to be preached from the pulpit. And so he actually paid churches to hire uh, preachers who would not preach anti-slavery, you know, who would sit on the fence. That was the official uh, position for, for many religions. You know, they didn't say they were pro or, or anti, but they didn't, you know, they were scared. So they just sat on the fence and, and didn't do anything about it. And in return for this money that Theophilus's church was given, they agreed to switch their doctrines uh, from the, the new church, which was anti-slavery, to the old church, which was sitting on the fence. And so when Elizabeth is challenging some of these thinking you know she she's completely within her right to do that because the church has actually switched and right. she's challenging that they've done that you know <laughs> so um yeah it was it was insane but she yeah. ended up in an yeah. insane asylum <laughs> and, and um you know it um it, like you said it's it's uh it's really interesting that um the church had switched the ideas and so and, and so she was legitimately questioning but legitimately questioning is not a, something that a woman should be doing exactly. at all. A exactly. woman shouldn't be questioning anything. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, if somebody reads through this book and was really uh, touched by this story as I was, what is the one thing you would like your readers to take away from this book? Um. I, I mean, I, I want them to know about Elizabeth because I think she deserves to be 
remembered um and i have a story to tell you about that in a set which i'll um i'll add in a moment um so i hope you know i hope on a basic level they come away knowing about elizabeth hopefully being an advocate for her as well and telling other people do you know this about this amazing woman that you know history forgot about and she did all this really cool stuff and she's an amazing person to be a heroine for us an icon for us someone we can try and emulate her strength her participation in public life her determination to make the world a better place to hold power to account um you know so I, I hope it's too I, I hope they remember Elizabeth and I hope they are inspired in their own lives by all the incredible aspects that she had to her personality um and the final coda that I wanted to mention about remembering Elizabeth um was that you know when I started researching my book there were no memorials to Elizabeth anywhere you know there was no special collection where I could go and research it was sort of very scrappy research having to find these books that she'd self-published and um so on and so forth but I did find that there was a hospital in Springfield Illinois um, that honoured Dr McFarland, the superintendent of the Illinois State Hospital, who had kept her incarcerated, along with all those other sane women that she finds in the hospital. And it, you know, when they named the hospital, they named it after him. I went to visit it. It had a, an oil painting of him hanging in the lobby. It had, oh, wow. uh, you know, his gold top cane was there, sort of like a, almost like a shrine to him in, in the lobby of this mental hospital. And anyway, I'm very pleased to report that after my book came out, some incredible women in the State Department at Illinois thought it was wrong that Illinois had a hospital named after Dr. Andrew McFarland. And so they embarked on a career to change the name. And in August this year, 2023, the governor of Illinois came out in a special ceremony and he tore down McFarland's name and he rose Elizabeth Packard's in its place so the hospital is now named after Elizabeth instead oh that's amazing oh I love <laughs> that, that story because cool? <laughs> <laughs> that was something I was reading it I, I don't know if it was in some of the notes or something in your book but I was reading about the fact that they did have a memorial to Dr McFarland I'm thinking yeah. that's so wrong that's so wrong yeah Oh, that's wonderful news. That's really, really good. Great. So I need to add I need to add a coda to, to the book for any future reprints um, to say that actually in August this year, it, it literally is hot off the press. It was literally a couple of months ago. Um, they have now changed the name. So it's the Elizabeth Packard Mental Health Centre now instead. I love it. I love it. That's wonderful. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Uh, so I I have now added Elizabeth Packard to my uh, list of female role models. <laughs> brilliant thank you <laughs> she's right up there with clara barton and yes. um, do you have any other female role models i know you you really respect it and the radium girls too were amazing absolutely i mean you know that's my sort of go-to answer to a question like that you know who are my female role models the radium girls for me and i think partly because i really connected to their story you know through directing the play directing my actors to play it then embarking on this passion project of writing this history book when I'd never written a history book, meeting their families, you know, I was just so, this story was just such a huge part of my life and a huge part of my heart. Um, and I think the Radium Girls were so incredibly courageous, you know, I don't know if uh, people know the story, but it's about these American women from the First World War and Roaring Twenties. They're poisoned with the radioactive radium paint they're working with. They're told to lick their paintbrushes when they're painting dials on clocks and watches. And so they ingest the radium and it poisons them. And they embark on this landmark fight for justice to try and hold the employers to account and to bring to the world's knowledge the dangers of radiation. Um, and they were just extraordinary because they did all of this while they were suffering so greatly with the poisoning. And yet they found the strength and the dignity to, to fight, you know, Catherine Dunahue, there are pictures of her literally giving evidence, you know, almost on her deathbed, on her sofa at home. She's collapsed in court. She can't get there. You know, they literally go and she's lying on the sofa using sort of the last vestiges of her breath to hold this company to account. And I just think they were remarkable. So for me, that that's where I go to. And if I'm, you know, struggling with something in my life, I always, be, I always think either, you know, what would they have done or 
what they went through and managed to combat is so much more than whatever thing I am stressing about that it helps me put things in perspective I think really and and, and think you know uh, realize how lucky I am with with what I have when so much was taken from them Right. Yeah. I, that, I remember seeing that photograph in the book that was when yeah. we were laying on the couch and, and surrounded by people and, and they're taking a testimony and that's right. Um, just, yeah. uh, just heartbreaking. Uh, and, and, they, and, and they were also going against um, doctors, medical yeah. doctors who said radium was fine. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, a, mind, it's mind boggling now. Like when, when I was writing the early part of the book, you know, in the sort of 1910s and 1920s and, you know, people are literally buying radium cosmetics, you know, blusher, radium blusher to give you a glowing complexion. It's in butter and milk and, you know, chocolate. Chocolate's got sugar and radium in it to give you that pep, you know. <laughs> it's right. just, you, you just, how, how was that? possible you know it just seems remarkable now looking back on it knowing how dangerous radioactivity is and radiation is you know it's just you just can't believe it was ever uh, treated in such a cavalier way and, and that's and and when I was reading that I was I was thinking back to uh during the civil war how how doctors uh would prescribe mercury for everything yeah uh, you know, mercury was the cure-all uh, you have a, a pneumonia, take take some mercury. You you have a stomachache, yeah. oh, have some mercury. And you know, and and it was a, the fight uh, uh, by uh, Dr. William Hammond, who was the Surgeon General, actually came out and said, you know, mercury is is horrible. It's it's poisonous. It's bad. And he yeah. actually ended up you know losing his job because of the pushback from the medical community. So when yeah. I'm reading Radium Girls, I'm thinking of that fight as well. And it just seems to be you know people for with with a lot of forethought and 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 who are fighting and and they know that something is bad uh, have to go up against all of these other people that are claiming you know superior knowledge and and you know yeah. we, we know better than you. Exactly. And as you say, you, you know, you see it throughout history, you know, that you hearing you speak about that made me think of uh, someone I researched for the book, but it, I don't think it ended up in there. Uh, Dr. Semmelweis, um, who was the doctor who realised when like that maternal mortality was so high, particularly in hospitals, if women went into hospital to give birth, they, you know, if there was a problem, they would often die. And it was he realised it was because doctors weren't washing their hands between patients, you know, something so simple. But when he tried to say this, you know, the, the medical community was outraged that he would suggest it was, you know, the doctor's dirty hands that were causing infection in patients. Um, so he was ostracized. He wasn't believed. He ended up in an insane asylum, um, you know, and in a way on a, on a kind of, you know, it, it, it's a similar trajectory was Elizabeth Packard. You know, she, she was talking about women's rights and you know, things that she thought, um, you know, how how the world should be. And people were like, no, that's that's not right. But whereas today we read her and think, well, absolutely everything she is saying is is sane and, um, you know, should be adopted mm -hmm. by the world, as in the case of, of Dr. Semmelweis as well. Right. And then, I mean, I know that there were some surgeons uh, who thought using anesthesia was bad. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah. Thank God they didn't win. <laughs> And and then of course you know during the during the Civil War too you have the whole issue of of uh, you know they don't understand about germ theory and everything but uh, mm -hmm. you know they 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 are the doctors are literally in some cases you know infecting their patients yeah. and and then Joseph Lister comes out with his whole germ theory thing and and but but he he was he was uh, ostracized a lot of the time from the medical community yeah. that they thought he was nuts. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, you know, people come up with these, you know, these brilliant ideas and, and yeah. or, or revelations and, and, you know, it just seems to be the idea of, of they're just push them aside. They're crazy. We don't want to change the status quo. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I want to uh, I want to thank everybody for for tuning into our uh, our really interesting, amazing live stream today. Uh, I would like to uh, to also recommend if you like programs like this, uh, please consider becoming a member of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, it's your support that allows us to have programs like this. Our our website is uh, civilwarmed.org, med, so you can please check us out. And I want to. 
say uh, many thanks to Kate Moore for taking part in our discussion today. And mm -hmm. also want to let everybody know that she will be back next year for our Between the Lines book club. We will be featuring The Woman Who Cannot Be Silenced mm -hmm. as one of our, our book choices for our book club next year. Uh, you can check out our website. Usually in January, we're going to be posting uh, the books that we have chosen for our book club and the dates that we will be talking to the authors. Uh, so, Kate, any uh, any closing uh, statements that you would like to to make? Um, I think I think I'll just say two things. One, a huge thank you to you, Tracy, for reaching out to me and asking me to do this, and to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, of course, to everyone uh, joining us and, and watching later as well. Um, and then also, if anyone is interested to know more about my books or my work, um, you can visit www.kate-more.com. That's kate-more.com. And I have a very occasional author newsletter uh, that you can sign up to on my website if you want to. Thank Excellent. You. And we'll be sure it, when we post this video, we'll be sure to put that in, in, the, uh, in the links below. Thank you. Uh, so we'll have a link to, to Kate's website and we'll also have a link to, to our website as well. Uh, so I uh, want to thank everybody who tuned in. And uh, everyone have a wonderful day and, and go, go get your copy of uh, The Woman Who Could Not Be Silenced and you won't be able to put it down. I've read this in, in like two days. Thank you, Tracy. <laughs> and I'll see you all in the new year. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Tracy. Bye. Right, bye. -bye.